Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're all back from coffee. If there's anyone outside, tell them to come in. I applaud your stamina. It is sunny outside, I've heard, and many of you have been here since nine o'clock, and um, I applaud that stamina. But we have come to the seventh and the last session of the day. And before I introduce our guest, I would like you to start thinking of questions for her. So please, get tweeting and get thinking. So, without further ado, can I please have your attention? We're going to cross now to Ann Arbor in Detroit, to the University of Michigan, where Yuen Yuen Ang is standing by. Let's see if we see her. She's an associate professor of political science and she'll be delivering the keynote speech of the conference on complexity and development. Hello, Yuen Yuen. Can you hear us? Yes. Excellent. Thank you very Istanbul much to Detroit. Excellent. Yes. Okay, so our, our audience, I'm encouraging them because it's 5 p.m. here. Mm -hmm to think of questions, to pay attention. This is the final <laughs> session of, of the day. Um, so, okay, the digital floor is yours. Take it away. Wonderful. Well, hello to everyone in Istanbul, first of all. Um, thank you very much to the UNDP for having me in part of this very exciting uh, dialogues. I woke up early this morning to catch some of the conversations uh, they were very thought-provoking and invigorating, uh, in fact, so invigorating that I have not needed to drink any coffee yet. Uh, as the last speaker, I know everyone had a long day of really intensive conversations. Um, I hope to tie together a few themes of the day and to channel your attention to an agenda of action i.e. the potential role of the UNDP in directing improvisation. Okay. So let's begin with a sense of the big picture in which we are in. Can everyone see the slides? Yes, I wasn't sure. Can everyone see the slides? Okay, great. All right, so the big picture of global development is that we are at a critical turning point. Um, I think we've come to a growing wide consensus that the earlier log frame approach to development doesn't work. It's unrealistic, it's annoying, it doesn't actually achieve the results that we hope for, and in fact, it often makes things worse. So the alternative to the log frame approach is we recognize that development is in fact a complex problem. It has many moving parts, a lot of interaction, a lot of unpredictability. And so it's good that we have made this ideational shift from the log frame to a recognition of development as a complex problem. But if you read the blogs, the books, and various dialogues about complexity, you see that the frequently recommended actions are along the lines of Think outside the box, tailor to settings, drive systems change, adopt entrepreneurial mindset, tolerate risk, embrace innovation. And these are all great places to start. But what I'm going to argue today is that they don't address the really difficult question of how. Right? How do you think outside the box? How do you tailor the settings? How do you embrace innovation? And the how is the hard question, and it is also the critical question. And so this is why I distinguish today between two types of approaches to complexity. The first I'm going to call complexity and development 1.0. This is the set of discussion that tells us, points out to us, that development problems are complex with no cookie cutter solution. And I want to say that tremendous credit should be given to this literature for telling us that, that, that there are no cookie cutter solutions. Because for some time, people actually believe that these solutions uh, existed. And much of the prescription of this literature is that 
given that development is complex, we should therefore adapt. You know, we should innovate, we should experiment, we should transform systems. But complexity 1.0 doesn't tell us how. It doesn't tell us how we can do these things. I therefore take you to my approach, which I call complexity and development 2.0. 2.0 built on the shoulders of giants in the 1.0. If there hadn't been the earlier 1.0 literature, we wouldn't be at 2.0. With 2.0, my starting point is that we need to recognize that in the first place, enabling adaptation is the problem, right? If it's easy to innovate, if it's easy to experiment, if it's easy to transform systems, we would have done it long ago. And then we would have solved all our problems. And the fact that we haven't yet done it already indicates that enabling adaptation is the first order problem. So we need to think about this problem. What I propose, therefore, is an agenda for research and practice that focuses on identifying what are the conditions and designs that enable effective adaptation. For this, we need a combination of methods, theory, as well as evidence. So this is what I mean by complexity and development 2.0. And having read the UNDP strategic plan, I think the changes that are proposed are extremely exciting, indeed revolutionary. And in my view, I think the language of the UNDP strategic plan fits exactly in what I call complexity 2.0. The strategic plan talks about the UNDP's aspiration to transform itself from a solution provider to a solution enabler to become an enabler of systems transformation. So if you look at the language of the report, what it really is aspiring to be is not just saying that we should adapt, we should innovate, but really focusing on you know, what exactly are the designs and the institutions that we need to build, including within the UNDP, in order for the organization to become an enabler of solutions. In my presentation today, which I'm going to try to keep as short as possible, I'm going to draw on my book, How China Escaped the Poverty Trap, which was published in 2016. Now, for anyone who looks at a book with this cover and with the title China, it is rather perplexing to think that such a book could have anything to do with complexity. Because if anything, the moment we think about China, we think about an authoritarian political system, it appears to be the opposite of complexity. And so, in fact, what I'm going to argue today is that reform era China is actually one of the best illustrations of hashtag adaptive development, hashtag complexity principles, long before these became buzzwords in global development. Much of the world doesn't realize that. In fact, even many of my colleagues and students in China have never realized that. So the short answer to how China escaped the poverty trap and managed to pull off a massive economic and social transformation within a single generation can be summed up in this phrase, this idea of directed improvisation. And how this works is basically that when the reformist leadership under Deng Xiaoping took over power, he decided that they were not going to democratize. They were going to keep the Chinese Communist Party firmly in power. At the same time, however, he actually behind the scenes introduced really deep bureaucratic reforms into the rest of the apparatus. And these reforms started by changing the functions and the role of the leadership. Whereas it used to be a commander and a dictator, Beijing transformed its role to that of a director, an actor that sets up the parameters and the framework and the environment for adaptation across the rest of the massive organization. This then provides the conditions for bottom-up improvisation using existing resources by numerous local governments spread out throughout China. And it's helpful to keep in mind that China is a very big country. It is more like a continent than it is a country. 
So being able to activate and mobilize these millions of bureaucrats across the country is a very key source of innovation for a previously communist planned economy. By combining top-down direction and bottom-up improvisation all within the Chinese Communist Party system, the outcome that you see in China in the past 40 years has been diverse solutions tailored to local conditions and stages of development. And this is the story of China that I think has been completely underplayed in the media, which tends to play up the idea of China being very monolithic and being authoritarian. But in fact, all of us who study China know as a matter of fact that the pattern of China, the pattern of development in China is highly localized. And this concept of diverse solutions tailored to local conditions is a buzzword in global development, we call it localization, but it is in fact not um, alien to Chinese thinking because there is an exact translation for that term. This is an ancient Chinese proverb and, and proverbs in China come in four characters and so and Chinese characters are like pictograms and so each of these characters mean according to place tailor a good fit. And so when I show this to my colleagues in China, they're quite surprised, pleasantly, because they realize that, in fact, in Chinese thinking and philosophy, the idea of localization has always been there. So I think there are very useful lessons that we can learn from this one massive political system that has managed to turn itself into an adaptive organization. Today, I'm not going to talk about the improvisation part of my research. And if you are interested in more details on that, you can look at my previous talks and blogs. I would point you in particular to my blog at the World Bank that talks about improvising strategies across cases, not only in China, but also in early modern Europe, 19th century America, even Nollywood and Nigeria. And from all of these cases, the common theme is that societies are capable of using normatively weak or wrong institutions like piracy, patronage, communes, taxes, finance, to build markets. It doesn't mean that weak institutions by themselves would cause an economic miracle. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that if you provide the right adaptive environment, then actors are in a capacity and a position to use whatever they have to solve problems. And this includes normatively weak and wrong institutions. But the focus today will not be on the improvisation part, as I've said. Instead, I want to focus on the top-down direction part, i.e., what are the types of direction, the types of rules and incentives and structures that you need to set up in order for actors in a massive organization to behave adaptively. And I think that really is one of the core issues facing UNDP right now in its efforts to embrace complexity. So what is directed improvisation and how is it different from the conventional wisdom? All of the blogs and the books and the dialogues you read out there under the label of hashtag complexity. Now, if you just go on Twitter and you check hashtag complexity, you read many, many of um, these blogs and tweets that sort of suggest the idea that embracing complexity means to always give more freedom and cut rules. And that's very intuitive. You know, if we want things like adaptation, creativity, it seems to imply that we should just give people as much freedom as possible. So these are sort of two random quotes that I got from the Internet. Uh, one of them says that the complicated way of doing things is to centralize control. And the complexity way is to delegate and grant autonomy and maximize local flexibility. And this is another quote. It says, mass is not always good, but if we are trying to be too tidy and too organized, that's not very good. If we experiment with improvisation, with ambiguity, with disruption and new challenges, we might well be surprised by how that improves things. And granted, these appear to be entirely reasonable suggestions. Right? That if you want to be creative, if you want to have complexity, that you should just have as much freedom as possible. But this idea is in fact misleading because improvisation, adaptation, innovation does not mean anything goes, 
do whatever you want and no rules. This is a misconception, and it is really important for anyone who wants to take complexity seriously to start by understanding that. In fact, effective improvisation requires direction and rules as a prerequisite. Good example of this is theater arts, performing arts. In acting, they do improvisation, but this certainly is not an exercise where actors just do whatever they want. Instead, this is an exercise that only is useful under the guidance of a skilled director. So then, the question that we need to ask is, what kind of direction? What kind of direction should we need to provide in order to make the improvisation process effective? So that is the key question. So in my book, you'll find that I specify. The necessary types of direction in three different areas, and I group them into the themes of variation, selection, and niche creation. These are three processes that we find in any situation of adaptation and evolution. In each of these themes, I highlight some of the key how problems that you need to tackle in order to create the right environment for adaptation. So, under variation, the key problem is. How do you set boundaries on experimentation? The issue here is not just that you should let people experiment. The issue here is how do you let people experiment, but at the same time tell them that you can try some things out, but there are certain things that you should not change, right? So you want to have variate, variegated, various different types of instructions about things that you can experiment on and things that you shouldn't experiment on. Under selection, the key question is how do you clearly define and reward success? Because unless you have a clear definition of what it means to be successfully innovative, your agents really do not know what to do. They might understand on the literal level what innovation means, but they hesitate to take action because they are not sure if their actions would actually be praised and be rewarded. And so this is all about metrics and incentives. And under niche creation, the issue here is how do you foster complementarities across diverse units? Diversity is always sort of a pretty favorable word in organizations, but diversity can be a real challenge because diversity could also lead to silos. It could lead to the lack of communication across units that are functionally very different. So while you want to have diversity, you need also to think about how do you foster complementarities across them. So these are three really practical how problems to be solved, and they don't have easy answers. So when I say complexity 2.0, this is about designing strategies to tackle these how problems. It is a practical agenda, and it is a concrete agenda. So just to illustrate. Some of these ideas and some of these problems, I'm going to focus just on the problem of variation. How do you set boundaries on experimentation? And we can think about this problem in the context of the Chinese political system. It has a massive bureaucracy of 50 million public employees, which is the size of the entire population of South Korea. Right, so this is a massive organization. And when they allow or permit experimentation, it couldn't possibly be that the CCP says go ahead and do anything you want, because what you're going to get if you do that is just massive chaos in a massive organization. So then the question is, how does the Chinese Communist Party set boundaries on experimentation? The answer lies in the way they give out commands. Now, if you think about commands in China, I think the instinctive answer would be that an authoritarian system would give really strict commands that says exactly what these different local governments should do at all times. In fact, there are three different varieties of commands in China, and I group them into red, black, and gray. Red commands are instructions from Beijing that clearly forbids a particular action. It is an instruction that says this is something that you cannot change, that you cannot innovate, that you cannot experiment with. You have to very strictly stick with this instruction. 
Black commands are instructions that clearly sanctions a particular action that says in clear language, "This is something that we approve of. Go ahead, do it." And then there is a third variety: instructions with varying degrees of ambiguity, and because they are deliberately unclear, they neither say whether you can or cannot do something. They permit bounded experimentation. This process of bounded experimentation generates feedback from localities across China that goes right back up to Beijing in a feedback loop, which then gives Beijing the necessary feedback to decide: should we change the policy to a red or black command? So, as you can see, despite the fact that China is a single-party system, it has a very adaptive. Flexible communication structure within its bureaucracy, and this ambiguity, furthermore, can actually be quantified. So we can collect data and get evidence on policy ambiguity. This is my new empirical project, and this is as a first step. What we have done here is to analyze all of the policies that were ever issued by the State Council, which is equivalent to the Prime Minister's office. By sector, using machine learning techniques that、uh, train the machine to classify different documents into whether they are ambiguous documents, and as you can see from this figure, there is tremendous variation in the amount of ambiguity. So this proves the point that is not the case that if you want to be adaptive, just give as much ambiguity and discretion as autonomy as you can. Right? There is strategic variation. So you can see on the one hand, on the right hand, that the kind of policies with the highest amount of ambiguity and therefore space for experimentation are policies on new industries like e-commerce, artificial intelligence, and precisely because they are so new and so unpredictable, the state councils allows them to have a lot of ambiguity. On the other end of the spectrum, you see that on issues like foreign affairs, banking, and securities. These are the type of policy areas where they want to have a lot more control and predictability, and so you find less ambiguity. So this is just a simple illustration of the fact that it's not the case that if we embrace complexity, we just give people as much autonomy as possible. You need instead to think about what are the areas that we want to give autonomy, and what are the areas in which we actually might want to constrain autonomy. So it's a much more intelligent design problem. So that is an illustration. What I've previously shown you is an illustration of the types of directions that Beijing provides under the theme of variation, placing boundaries on experimentation. But this is one among many other actions that are taken by Beijing to create an adaptive system within its bureaucracy. So let me just very quickly read to you a few other examples of the directions that are provided. This includes scaling experiments that work. And also forbidding those that fail, and this is an action that only the central government can take because it is not up to the local governments to have the authority to scale experiments. The third thing that Beijing does is that it has played a critical integrative role in initiating incremental reforms across many connected domains. So rather than having big bang reforms or reforms in small pockets. It has a specific design of incremental reforms that happens across connected domains. On the selection side, Beijing does the important work of setting clear, narrow priorities about what these innovative bureaucrats are supposed to deliver. And these clear, narrow priorities are reflected accordingly in the matrix of the bureaucrats, and this is then matched by the application of. Very strong incentives, both career incentives and financial incentives. What you find in China, ironically, is that they have taken an existing communist bureaucracy and they corporatized it. It is perhaps one of the most corporatized governmental bureaucracy、uh, in the world. On the niche creation side, what Beijing has done is that it allows regions to tap on their natural competitive advantage. Instead of dictating their roles, as was done under communism, and yet at the same time actively encourage regional spillovers, Beijing plays a role in matchmaking poor and rich regions so that they can mutually benefit from each other's very different functions. I want to point out, however, 
that this chart does not mean that other organizations like the UNDP should blindly copy exactly what the CCP did. Because we have to bear in mind that these were the directions and the steps that were taken given the national goal of rapid capital accumulation. That for China, at least in the first 35 years, was the goal of development. And because the goal was rapid capital accumulation, this is the way it chose to direct improvisation. So it's important to take lessons from China, but we need to make modification. So finally, I get to some thoughts about the potential role of the UNDP in directing improvisation. And here I offer some ideas and thinking points. I wanted to emphasize that these are not policy recommendations because really the recommendations should be coming from the audience, from the professionals on the ground who are doing this work every day. And, and my role is just to provide some thinking points from the research that I've done. I've introduced for you this idea of directed improvisation in the context of China. I want to stress for the audience that while China is a single party variant of directed improvisation, single party rule is not a precondition of directed improvisation. So if you just look at the case of China, you can see that the actor that provides top down direction is the central leadership, is Beijing. The actors that perform bottom-up improvisation are the numerous local governments spread out throughout the country. And the combination of these actors within the apparatus of a single party system produces diverse solutions according to local conditions, despite the fact that they are a top-down central planning communist political system. Right? So this is a particular variant of directed improvisation where the specific actors are bureaucrats of the communist political system. We can, however, be creative and imagine that you can have multiple variants of directed improvisation. And in fact, you do see that all around us. In the corporate world, franchising is an excellent example of directed improvisation. So McDonald's, which I discuss in my book as well, is a franchise corporation. What a franchise corporation does is that it's basically the combination of top-down direction provided that by the corporate HQ combined with bottom-up improvisation by numerous franchisees across the globe. So if you have been to McDonald's around the world, which I have, very coherent, unified brand, there are local adaptations to the menu all over the world. So in Singapore, where I grew up, we had, you know, burgers with pineapples. And they are actually one of the, you know, best McDonald's burgers I've ever had. And so in the corporate world, you can see that it is possible to combine top-down direction with bottom-up improvisation that together produces a tailored, diverse menu of solutions um, that fit local conditions. And having understood that, then the final issue is, so where does the UNDP, where might the UNDP fit in all of this? And having read the strategic plan, if you look at the language of the strategic plan, it talks about the UNDP as an integrator, promoter of whole of government and whole of society responses, enabler of systems transformation, a focus on transnational development challenges. And all of this language to me suggests that in fact, the UNDP is actively thinking about the possibility of its role in directing improvisation in ways that are not entirely unlike McDonald's or even the Chinese Communist Party. So if you take the same chart and you change the actors, then we might imagine that directed improvisation can take place in the UNDP. The, the actor providing the directing would be the UNDP, but this requires a transformation of the role of the organization from that of top-down planning to directing. And this direction would have to focus on the various how problems that I have laid out earlier in my presentation. The bottom-up improvisation could be um, an action that takes place among various units within the UNDP if we are looking at internal organizational reforms it can also mean um, 
bottom-up improvisation that takes place among various country partners. If we are looking at reforming UNDP's external relations with many client governments, so by changing that, we have to change the actors, but the underlying principles are the same. If you can effectively combine these two, then it is possible to create an environment of diverse solutions tailored to local conditions. So let me conclude with four takeaways from what I know is a presentation with a lot of material. The first is a very basic point that it is time to us to move from complexity 1.0, agreeing that we should adapt and that we should innovate, to complexity 2.0. That is, we need to move to identify exactly how we can go about enabling adaptation and innovation. And in my book, in my research, my work is focusing on specifying the hows that need to be solved, which I have organized into various themes and processes. And I also want to emphasize the importance of evidence, right? In order to know how these hows might be tackled or solved, we need at least some type of demonstration case. We need at least demonstration cases that tell us what works. And what doesn't work, so we have some type of concrete guidance as to how to move forward, what actions to take, you know, what practical changes to make. And therefore, if we understand and if we embrace complexity 2.0, I think China's development and governance process can therefore offer concrete insights and lessons for other organizations, including the UNDP. And why is that? Because if you really think about what the Chinese case is about, it is essentially a case of how do you take a massive hierarchical central planning organization and make it adaptive, right? And so, in fact, we, we might actually find some parallels between the Chinese system and the UNDP to the extent that these are both massive organizations. They're both hierarchical. They have actors spread out throughout the globe. And they are traditionally used to doing central planning, but if it's possible for China to take its bureaucracy and is radically transform it into a highly adaptive and flexible system, then I think that there are probably some concrete lessons that we can draw from its experience. But I want to stress that while these lessons may be applied to UNDP's role as a solution enabler, we need, of course, to make many. Many modifications because the context, of course, is very different. And if we go back to blind copying, we would be going down the wrong path. But I would actually turn the task of these modifications to experts on the ground, to people in the audience like you, to continue the conversation, the thinking, and the work of how we can go about seriously embracing complexity in development work. So thank you very much for having me, and I look forward to your questions and your reactions. Okay. Right. Do we have any questions from the audience? There is a question right at the back, Millie, I believe. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it is.、Um, hi, Professor Wen Wen. This is Millie、um, from UNDP. Thank you so much Hello, for. Hello, Millie. Very nice to meet you virtually. Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much for a great presentation.、Um, we've、uh, today we we had a lot of discussions about all of the new trends that are coming up that might be either enablers. Or hindrances to achieving SDGs,、um, and and how difficult it is to regulate some of them because simply we don't know much about things like artificial intelligence and biotech and what have you. Now the work that you've done looks at this new types of you know, a certain type of policies in China ambiguous、uh, through which they inspired variation so they can learn more and ultimately have either a prohibitive or facilitating policy. My question is whether this can work backwards. Whether we can apply your research to intentionally build ambiguous policy spaces is not to necessarily prematurely kill 
um, a certain new trend that might prove useful in order to feed this, um, in order to inspire experimentation. Whether, there, whether you find there is demand for this type of work or whether there are any countries already doing some of this work. Thank you. Thank you, Millie, for your question. Um, I am not sure if there are other countries doing this type of work, but on your question about whether we can do it backward, maybe a different way to think about the question is, you know, if uh, any organization, any government, including within the UNDP itself, if you are thinking about how do we, how do we promote experimentation but set boundaries about around it, what are the policy domains, you know, what are the areas in which this organization would consider to be something that I would put in the red category versus the black category versus the gray category. And then within the gray category, you can have many different degrees of discretion and ambiguity. So perhaps that is a place to start a conversation, a collective conversation within the organization about, first of all, what do you think are the red lines in your organization? Right? And what are the things that you feel completely confident that everyone should do? And then in the gray box, you know, what are the, what are the different rank levels of, right levels of ambiguity, ambiguity that you want to give out? So I would think about this more of as a, a, a sort of a, a thinking guideline, an operational guideline of um, thinking about what are the different levels of ambiguity that an organization May, may I? Uh, hi, thanks, thanks for your uh, presentation. It was very interesting. And my name is Matteo Rivellini, uh, working for uh, European Investment Bank. Um, apologies if I had misunderstood something. But it, it, it looked to me that uh, you had outlined, uh, um, uh, let's say, the, the Chinese recipe for um, um, a very rapid uh, growth and development uh, as being a a directed improvisation, as you, as you called it, from, uh, uh, let's say, a top-down, single-party direction, allowing for then bottom-up improvisation. And my question relates to what is happening uh, in the Western Balkans at the moment, uh, and what is the approach that uh, the European Union is having towards the, the region uh, as far as the, uh, its enlargement uh, uh, is concerned. In the past, we have seen the European Union looking at the Western Balkans uh, with uh, you know, a preference for a full stability over full democracy. Recently, we have seen the European Union strategy for Western Balkans saying that uh, for the Western Balkans to join the European Union, uh, full democratization processes need to happen uh, and this would also allow catching up the living standards of the European Union. In other words, democratization is one way, one of the ways through which the region may catch up with the European Union. My question is, uh, is it possible to apply your recipe with a full, full democrat democratic system which is not composed of a single party stable, uh, uh, let's say, director, but at the top of your presentation having a full democratic, let's say, system made of uh, uh, a number of parties, a number of oppositions, and so on and so forth with a full democratic process. Thank you. Thank you. I think that, um, thank you for this very uh, important question and a question that I very frequently get. I think at the outset it is really important to clarify that I'm not talking about a Chinese recipe. I think the word recipe makes me a bit worried because the word recipe immediately implies sort of we will copy exactly what this person did. Right? So if the Chinese made a Sichuan fish dish, you know, we will make the same Sichuan fish dish. And so this is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that in the Chinese context, their goal was to have rapid, 
capital accumulation. They wanted rapid economic growth. It was not SGDs. It was not sustainable development or green development. And at the same time, keep a political system where there was only the CCP power. So those were their goals, economic and political. And then the challenge for them is, how do we create an adaptive system to create solutions for the goals that we've set for ourselves? So what we need to learn from China is not their goals, right? Because the UNDP and other countries have very different goals, democracy being one of them. But instead, what we need to learn from China is how did they create that adaptive environment, the adaptive system, so that they can create so many diverse solutions for these two broad goals that they set for themselves. So what we need to learn is to really stare at this chart and think very seriously about the various how questions that are laid out. Because these how questions, as you can see, are generic. You can find them in China, you can find them in corporations, you can find them in UNDPs, you can find them in universities. Look at these how questions and think about how do you apply them in your particular context. It could be the EU, it could be the UNDP, it could be a particular country or just a small NGO. How do you set boundaries on experimentation? How do you clearly define success? How do you make diverse units work together? Right. So these are very practical, generic how questions. And all I'm saying is that we can take some lessons from China because they have done this for 40 years. They have shown some success, so we can take some concrete lessons on how they were able to do it. So that's all I'm saying. It's not a recipe for copying. Hello? Can I ask a question? Hello, over here, on the right, over here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Neil Walker. I'm the head of the United Nations in Ukraine. It was a really interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, we've been talking Thank about you. the sustainable development goals here, uh, and I actually didn't sort of see it in your in your uh, in your presentation explicitly, but implicitly it seems it's like right there. If we're talking about what kind of top-down directives might actually be useful, the sustainable development goals, at least from the combination of the United Nations perspective and from the perspective of the 190 plus governments that have signed off on the SDGs, they provide a really powerful conceptual framework that's also quantifiable. You measured, you mentioned the need for quantification, ability to provide metrics on what's being achieved and what isn't being achieved. So, the, and then the, the opposite side of that is bottom up, local adaptation, improvisation, almost a friendly competition kind of a, a situation in which local communities get to work towards the objectives that are outlined in the uh, SDGs. So I, I would just like you to maybe comment more explicitly on how you see, you know, this this particular framework that you're uh, you're outlining uh, as in terms of the SDGs. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So there is, I think, one particular problem that jumps out at me when I think about the SDGs. Because if we look at the Chinese experience, one of the reasons for their rapid economic growth, if we consider that to be one type of success, and I'm not, I'm not endorsing that success, I'm just saying that that is one metric of success. Um, the reason that they were able to achieve that is that in the beginning of the reform process, they set themselves, they set the bureaucracy, very narrow priorities. The priority was on economic growth, and everything else was deprioritized, including things like equality, environmental protection, um, poverty re uh, uh, targeted poverty relief, and so forth. And precisely because their criteria for success was so narrow and so clear, for the bureaucrats who are doing the improvisation and the adaptation, it was very clear for them that what they, what they were expected to deliver. You know, they, it was very clear to them that if I did this, I had this outcome, I would be considered successful in my organization. And this then drove them to make the massive changes, to come up with sometimes really radical solutions. But if we look at the SDGs, I think the real challenge is that the SDGs covers everything. Right? It is really ambitious, which is good. But because it is so ambitious, I think when it comes to implementation, um, bureaucrats or the implementers will really ask themselves, what do you want me to focus on? What do you want me to start with? What is my metric of success? 
know, what is it that I'm supposed to do and what innovations would you consider me to be a really successful bureaucrat? And if you don't solve that problem in one way or another, then what you probably end up with is a lot of talk about SDGs, about innovation. These are all great things, but it's very hard to get implemented because the implementer doesn't know exactly what are his or her foremost priorities. What are the rewards, the incentives, are the, and the metrics that go along with these very core priorities? So I would just throw that out as something important to think about, because at least in the Chinese experience, they started out with really narrow, clearly defined priorities that came at a price, and they lived with that price. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Akif Hi. Koja from PwC. Uh, thank you for the very interesting presentation. Uh, to my understanding, direct improvisation uh, requires two things to happen at the same time. One is that you need to have a right top-down direction, and at the same time, you need to have successful but uh, bottom-up innovation. Uh, but for the latter to, uh, to happen, you need to have capable people uh, and institutions at the local level. Uh, and, but how uh, can we make sure that uh, the institutions and the people at the local level uh, in, improve their capacities and their innovation, uh, innovation capabilities? And uh, are there any learnings from the Chinese case? Yeah, thank, thank you very much. I think you have uh, accurately summed up um, the idea of directed improvisation. And as to your question of, you know, how do you mobilize, activate the local communities, the answer lies precisely in the nature of the top-down direction. And what I want to emphasize is that when we think about the phrase top-down direction, it sounds really easy, right? It sort of seems straightforward. Almost instinctively, when we hear top-down direction, we're thinking commands. These, this is what I'm going to tell you to do exactly. But... If you look at my presentation and if you read my book, you realize that the directions that I'm talking about are not commands. They are actually a different type of work. They are about the work of a leadership setting up the conditions so that the local actors are motivated, equipped, and capable of improvising. So this includes everything from setting parameters, putting boundaries on experimentation, to creating the right metrics, to creating right incentives, to matchmaking diverse units within an organization. So it's helping us to think about what exactly are the types of direction that the leadership needs to provide in order to achieve precise, which is how do you activate the potential of those local communities. Thank you. No more questions. Okay. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll leave it there then. That was Mrs. Yuan Yuan Ang, Associate Professor of Political Science, joining us from the University of Michigan in Detroit. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me.